Hi, my name is Bill Weisinger, and I'm showing you my sculpture, which I call Phoenix Salmon. Why I call it that, we'll get to after a bit, but first, let me take you through the carving process. So this began as a boulder, I mean, basically the size of what you see. So the brown kinging you see there, that was the outer edge of the boulder, which they call the rind. So this was the very outer edge right there. You can see a little brown tinging right there. That also was the very top of the boulder, and the boulder had a little piece there, so this tail was also in the rind. In terms of where the original boulder was compared to the sculpture, this curve of this fish here is the curve of the original boulder. And obviously I indented here, the original boulder would have continued around there. But this curve was a perfect curve for the salmon and was one of the things actually that gave me the idea for, um, for the form. So this form here determined where this fish was going to be. This tail up here, which was a jutting up piece from the rock, determined both where this fish was going to be and also the angle of the fish coming down, because that was mandated by the rock. So I began carving uh, the boulder, working down through the middle and coming out. Uh, and then I had a problem because a piece broke off. And I was like, oh no! So I got much more conservative. So I ended up carving a sculpture, not this sculpture, although it would have looked like it. I ended up carving a sculpture which was much more conservative, like there was a big rock here part of the stone, part of the alabaster, but, but I had a big rock there to support the nose of this fish. And much of the interior was, uh, was, was uncarved. I tried to make it look like water or whatever. So I got it home and I got it to a gallery and it looked okay, it looked fine. Um, and I brought it home from the gallery. It didn't sell because it wasn't exciting. Uh, and it sat in my home for a while. I carried it out to the studio. I couldn't work on it because it was too precious. It was like, I'm art, don't touch me. So actually I wrote on it, I am not art and chip me and I am just a rock. So that freed me up and I was able to begin work. So the first thing I did was I took away this big rock here, um, which um, wasn't needed, and then I was able to have the nose of this, release the nose of this salmon. Um, and then I just started releasing the fish from the underlying rock from, from every way around. So that eventually it started to be exciting and you could really feel the movement uh, in the fish. So I, I pushed the, the limit a fair amount, I mean, it's only connected now to the underlying base in five spots. So this is the one big connection here, and it's a teensy-weensy connection there, and another one here, and another one there. But these are all, this is kind of the minimum that one could get away with and still support these, uh, these three fish. So I call it Phoenix Salmon for two reasons. First of all, as a message of hope. I mean, one hopes that the salmon will come back and there'll be food for the whales and plenty of fish uh, for everyone. So that's one reason why it's Phoenix salmon. And the other one is I brought it back, not from the dead, but I brought it back from boring. So I hope you like it. At least I think you won't find it boring. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Rudy Weisinger, and this is Red, White, and Blue. Sometimes a painting has a mind of its own, and this is such a piece. I had a different idea for this painting when I first put my brush to the canvas. It was nothing like this. Regardless of what I wanted, this piece rebelled. It resisted, refused, and would not cooperate with anything I wanted to do. Any of my attempts to alter it it declined 
to go in any other direction. Sometimes you just have to give in. Behold, red, white, and blue, a determined creation. Enjoy the show. My name's Kristen Wrights Green, and I'm an oil painter. I, I came from Vashon Island. I spent 17 years down there, and we just, my husband and I just moved here in May. Um, I paint large scale paintings of glass and food and sometimes animals. And um, a lot of my pieces um, are kind of messages in bottles. There's a lot of history to the, this bottle in particular. Um, this is Lydia Pinkham, and she was a person who lived in the 1800s, and she created tonics for women with female issues. <laughs> they were non-alcoholic tonics, and they still exist today. And so she was a really early um, female entrepreneur, and I appreciate that. So it's one of the things I like to bring to my work is that the bottles that I'm capturing have some meaning behind them. Um, this piece is uh, called Still Life and Evening, and it's a scene from my house. And I sometimes I set up um, my different glass bottles with flowers or things in them, sometimes just by themselves, and um, capture a moment. I work with the camera. Um, and capture a lot of settings of certain things and um, so I could get an accurate lighting. But then I love to have the bottle itself with me as I'm painting so I can really get the depth of what's happening in it. Um, a lot of, while I might be considered a hyper-realist, <laughs> there's a lot of abstraction in my work if you get close. And it's one of the things I like. The closer you are, the more abstraction you will see. Um, these little sections in here where the glass is muted in here. Some of it is more perfect. This piece down here took me endless amounts of time to get this um, braided um, coverlet just right. I might as well have been stitching that with thread because it took so long. <laughs> a piece like this generally takes me somewhere between 100 and 150 hours, and I'll generally do that in about a month's time. Uh, I spend a lot of work at that. Um, the other elements in this piece, these are some flowers from the summer that were in my yard that were beautiful cosmos, and this is a piece of a, a copper star that I just love the little bit of accent in that. And really, it's a color piece for me. Um, the difference of the turquoise to this coral red, which just drew my eyes in when I captured this moment. And it's really the thing um, that made me decide on this setting exactly, that I just uh, love that color combination. Yeah, and these flowers, um, there's a lot of, of depth in there and a shading of pinks in here. And um, they, they do, I, that was actually the last piece of the painting I did. I did everything else and I left that for the end and it, it took me quite a while to sort of capture light and shadow on each of those. And also not to have that overwhelm the letters of this, um, of the bottle itself. One of the other things about this piece, some people ask me about how I get the feeling of glass when I'm working this large. So I really work in, um, I grid a canvas before I start and I create some small, I work in sections so that a piece like this is basically finished paintings all connected together over the course of this whole piece. And sometimes I will do sections of letters at uh, it at a time, you know, some days I get three letters done, <laughs> and that's a big accomplishment for the day. But it's influenced by the work of Chuck Close, who was a very process-oriented painter and artist, and I loved uh, studying his work, and it, he's a big influence for me, as well as Wayne Tebow, who also painted lots of food and large things, and I, I just enjoy the work of both of those artists. They've influenced me greatly. Um, in my work. When I work on a painting like this, I will do it in small sections and like a piece in here, when you look really closely, you'll see the abstracted nature of it, that this is shown through the glass bottle. But as I'm painting it, I actually don't know what I'm working on. I'm looking at something on my computer and I'm creating 
what I see in that moment. And hopefully, if I've done it right, as I stand way back, you will see the thing that you want to see. Um, it, it, there's a lot of abstraction in here. And I do go and spend a lot of time w with the letters, trying to make the, get the exact little pieces of um, the painting correct. And while it's a large piece, <laughs> one of the things that I never use is large brushes. My brushes are at most this, uh, this big. So every little bit of this painting is done with a little teeny tiny brush. I am super pleased to be part of this show here at the San Juan Island Art Museum. Um, being new to the island, it's a thrill to see other people's art here and to associate the people with their pieces. Um, I'm loving meeting other artists here and uh, having that connection, it's amazing for me. Hi, I'm Shannon Borg, and this is my painting, Temple, at the Artist Registry Show at the San Juan Islands Museum of Art. Um, this painting is of a structure, a driftwood structure, that is at South Beach American Camp in the National Historical Park on San Juan Island. I've lived in the islands about, on this island, about 10 years, and then I was on Orcas Island for about three years before that. And I've always been fascinated with beaches and of course, the natural beauty. But when I learned about South Beach and started to spend a lot of time there, I realized that there's, it's a very special beach because people really interact with this beach. There is kind of a, an ancient feeling to this place and a sacred feeling to me. People build bonfires and then they build these structures that could almost feel like homes or shelters or temples or altars. And it's a really ever-shifting, ever-changing place that from afar, it doesn't look all that different than a regular beach. But when you go there and at different times of day and see the light changing, it's very fascinating. So this painting, I started with an undercoating like I do with a lot of, a lot of paintings. And it starts out with oil paint of, say, a, a, different co a few colors and I'll, I'll make that thin with some solvent. And then I'll just create these drips around the painting and just see what happens. It's a very much a random experience, um, seeing what the paint can do. And it's almost like I'm wanting the paint to collaborate with me on this painting. The paint can teach me how to paint. And so once I have that base coat of drips and texture, then I go in with a charcoal, um, vine charcoal, and start to create the drawing from some of the clouds or the horizon line, the sea horizon, and then start drawing this structure. And then I brush that down and start painting on, on that form that I've created. So I love how the drips and the textures then start to create these organic forms like wood, grain, or light, or different colors. And the, the driftwood itself is almost like a canvas because it's pale, so it's, um, it captures the light. So it can be so many different colors. At a bright sunset, it captures that gold and orange light. At, um, at, during a storm, it will be very dark if it gets wet or it can be white in the noon of daytime. So that is really part of the fascination. So at South Beach here, we have Mount Finlayson and the lighthouse, and then the beach comes around this way, and then this is right in front of us. It's been really interesting to see how these structures get built, and then they get taken down, and it's ever-changing and ever-shifting, um, and it almost feels like if you're there that you could be there a hundred or a thousand years ago and or more <laughs> um, of people coming to this place, finding the beauty, finding a place where they can be calm and engage with their thoughts and build these structures, build a fire, be in community and um, enjoy this beautiful experience. So I hope that you enjoy my piece and Thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Bryn Bernard, 
Um, and this is my painting final draft. It's in oil on canvas and it's uh, 24 inches wide by 36 inches tall. Um, I've been an illustrator for 40 years and a writer of illustrated books for 20. Um, my books include Dangerous Planet, um, Outbreak, The Genius of Islam, and my latest is The New Ocean. Um, and this is the title page for my current project, uh, which is called This Changes Everything, um, about the promise and problem of inventions uh, from language to artificial intelligence. So since this is a title page, um, you might be wondering what's going to go here. So uh, on the, the old moldering um, uh, bit of fragment of paper, um, that's where the title actually goes. This changes everything, the promise and problem of inventions. And then the keys here are my name, B-R-Y-N-B-A-R-N-A-R-D. Um, then down here is the colophon of the, uh, of the publisher, which is Random House, and this is, this is their um, Borzoi uh, imprint. I moved to Salmon Island in 1995 and to Lopez in uh, 2023. And soon after I arrived, I began uh, running the trails in the, the woods on both islands. And I often came across bits of leftover technology that were, um, uh, that had been left, left behind, old farm equipment, um, old logging equipment, uh, rusting away in the woods. And as I was casting about for an appropriate title page um, for this book, um, it occurred to me that uh, a, an old rusting typewriter might be just the ticket to, um, to ex express the idea, which I'm trying to communicate, that you come up with an invention to solve a problem, which creates uh, a new problem, which requires a new, more complex invention, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, until you get to the present day. Um, these, uh, the <clears throat> uh, the Im so the impetus for this was, was uh, what I just described. To, to get there, um, I had to, uh, I, no longer had an, I no longer had my parents' old Remington or my old Olivetti. So I went to antique stores and I looked online. I found Smith Coronas and Hermes and, and Adler's and Royals. And uh, I took lots of photos and did lots of sketches and stitched these together in Photoshop to create the skeleton of what would become this painting. I transferred that to my canvas, uh, which I, in pencil, sealed it with uh, a middle value acrylic, a transparent acrylic, and then worked up to the lights and down to the darks, starting with big, wide sable flats and then working uh, smaller and smaller to smaller flats and finally to pointed sables uh, to get the, the uh, level of detail and the, um, the level of finish and the feeling that I was looking for. And the feeling that I hope for people who are actually my age and actually used a typewriter, uh, it should be a little elegiac and maybe wistful. Um, uh, from dust we came and to dust we shall re return, as they say, whether it be people or the things people make. And for younger folks, those who haven't used typewriters, um, maybe this will be like a visit to Stonehenge uh, and a look back in time to when people were just the same as people are now, but they did things differently. And for everyone, I hope you can enjoy this as a piece of art, the final draft. Thank you. My name is Robin Meyer. I'm happy to introduce the Fulfilled Noon to students and lovers of art. The work and learnings from this piece um, came through the process. You must have your line in the water to catch a fish. You have to show up and begin, and then responding to the inner prompts that come, often repeated, ignored, and eventually the spark comes through the brush flies over the canvas, just like a conductor's wand. And eventually, it slows down and stops, or just stops in, in after an action. And you're left with the traces behind, and left with great satisfaction, gratitude, and a reinforcement of allowing for what comes. It may be an accident that you think, but no, you find that it is a working part of the piece telling, telling what the elemental idea is helping tell. Um, 
but continue learning in this piece to follow the ideas development wherever it may go. In this case, there were allusions to art history, to mythological beings, religious beings, historical beings. And I allowed them um, out of respect for the idea and for humanity that the canvas expresses. So these allusions are also found um, in um, the reference of the title, The Fulfilled Noon, which references a line from Walt Whitman's visionary poem, When Lilacs Last at the Dooryard Bloomed. And some of those uh, uh, visionary elements you may find in the piece. It, the piece was not an outcropping from Whitman's poem, but definitely my experience of the poem, along with my personal sense of audit, sensibilities of my uh, life experience in, in this mind body are on the canvas here um, for those that may be spend time to find those. Um, and to answer the question of the canvas support, how did it grow? It's so large. It started out as a plain air. I had two 40 by 30 canvases in the back of my van. I knew I wanted to paint these rising, actually, these sunflowers that were in the face of the sun to me. They were so tall and mighty and vital. And so I laid them out on the ground. They wouldn't fit on my canvas. And I attached uh, dried stalks to my brushes and painted on the ground this, this seed idea that came. And as I was painting, I witnessed these, these vital stalks and also the dying blossomed down at my feet that were just as beautiful and just as vital. And that is the idea that I came to understand, this, this unity of life and death, that it's all one energy, and that, um, that I needed to allow and grow the idea to show the one from the first two original panels. So I had to order up, find and order up canvases that would ex help me express on a canvas support this idea. And if you want further fleshing out of this process or my idea, um, or the idea, reference my artist statement. Thank you. Hi, I'm Steve Hill from Lopez Island. I've lived on Lopez Island since 1974, and I've been doing plein air landscape painting for about the past 20 years. I work in the pastel medium. I just want to do a quick introduction to this brand new book that got published by an artist who lives up north of Bellingham in the Cascade Mountains called Book of Earth. And it is a definitive uh, book about earth pigments, which is what pastel is made of. It comes from the earth. We all do, some way or another. So anyway, this is a great book. As you can see, she's got a big collection of something like 600 different pigments. She's collected from all over the world and has done a treatise on those in the whole rainbow of colors. It all comes from the earth. So if you get a chance to, to get that book, please do. One of the most important elements of painting for me is drawing. I draw everywhere I go. These just happen to be people in airports at various places I have visited over the past couple of years. I think this is Dubrovnik or Istanbul, one of the two. <clears throat> but I draw constantly. It's what you need to be able to paint well, uh, is to be able to draw. So uh, I just keep in practice, usually with the figure doing that. The painting here is, uh, the title is Cattle Point Light at Dawn. And this is at Cattle Point on San Juan Island. This was painted last spring, I believe, or summer, I think. Okay, and you can see there's some very summery, beautiful colors. It is daybreak out there, pretty close. I did this one this morning, if you can see over here, and I haven't titled it yet, but uh, that's Cattle Point Lighthouse at dawn as well, you know, uh, in the fog, of course. So a lot of different moods, and that's my objective when I'm painting is to capture the mood, the emotion, the light, uh, that's really what gets me going when I'm painting is to do all of those elements and make them work together. By contrast, I brought this, this was done exactly one week ago 
in uh, Captain Cook, Hawaii, on the Big Island. Uh, I just happened to be over there for two weeks with my wife, and so I painted this on site at a beach over there. And so we can see, you know, immediate color contrast and uh, the feeling of, of uh, <clears throat> the light in Hawaii versus the light on San Juan Island. So I paint all over the world. I teach workshops uh, in Croatia. I teach workshops across the United States in the pastel medium. I teach at Dakota in Mount Vernon. And uh, so that's what I do besides paint. So anyway, uh, this one, of course, has a figure walking across the uh, grassy field. There's sort of a path in there headed to the lighthouse. This one just has more fog than anything. So I wanted to have these two here as a contrast so that you could see the same location almost from the exact same spot where I set my easel up to work and uh, two completely different paintings. I often paint at locations around the San Juan Islands. My favorites are Cattle Point. Uh, this one back here is a larger one that I did just about a year ago during the winter and I call it Winter Sunrise Refraction and I just wanted to bring this, this is a print, this is not an original, the original is sold, but uh, this is just to underscore that the pastel medium is not anemic, that it is very strong, that you can get vivid, bright colors, dark colors, you can get all the colors you want with just using pastel sticks and uh, pure earth. I do want to thank uh, everybody here at the museum Karen especially, I've, what, this is about the third or fourth session we've had together, and uh, especially the fact that the museum offers this for all of the artists to be able to present their work and talk about it, because I don't know any other museums around the Pacific Northwest that do anything close to this, and I think it's a wonderful uh, gesture on the part of the museum, and certainly a way to chronicle all of the artists from the San Juan Islands who are working in this era, you know, we don't live forever, and it's nice that the film will, you know, so that we can have a record of whatever we've brought for the Artist Registry show and what we're presently working on. So, again, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Barbara McIntyre, and I live on San Juan Island. Um, I've been living here for between eight and nine years. And before that, I was in Santa Barbara, California, which has uh, quite a broad uh, base of assemblage artists. And this is an assemblage, or you could call it a found object collection or cr construction. Um, but basically, I make art out of other things. Now, the things I use are not found on the freeway. <laughs> I don't find them in parking lots, although I do find things in those places sometimes. Um, this is a collection of pieces that are all been collected. Um, this is called the Spanish Walk. Uh, Spanish walk is, I believe, it's because I have a horse that actually is a Lusitano and he can do the Spanish walk. We don't want him to, but he can and that's what it looks like. So as you can see, I put this together with all these various different parts. It started out with this piece, this copper piece, which I had made uh, for something else, and it was for a little bicycle, and I took the piece apart. I wasn't happy with it. And then I put this bigger wheel in it, and I went, oh, it's a head. So then I had to make some ears, and these are hammered copper. Um, this neckline is all a collection of tiny toy wheels. They're out of some kind of early plastic. I don't know if they're celluloid or or what. So what happens is I, I was wanting to use these old pieces. These are antique things, uh, toys wheels, again another tin wheel. Um, some of these are, are plastic wheels from toys. This one looks like it has a groove in it, so there must have been some other mechanism. Uh, what happens is, in my process, I don't usually start out with anything specific in mind. 
Um, but in this case, I was reusing this section and added the wheel in there and suddenly it looked like a head and then I put it onto here and then you add legs and it, you know instantly I have a horse uh, which for some reason is very easy for me to come up with and I've had horses off and on since I was 15 um, and I just thought having a bird perched on his rear section it balanced it out compositionally um, but I do love using uh, all these found objects. This actually is, is structural because it was difficult to attach this in a, in a structural manner. So I used the spoon uh, to strengthen that, that joint. So I, I do believe in uh, making things very, very solidly that are going to hold up through time. Uh, in Santa Barbara, I worked with a number of different assemblage artists, and the rule was it has to meet the fire hose uh, test, So, which is a, a failing with a lot of uh, assemblage. People are afraid to collect it because they're afraid it's going to fall apart. So I, I go very heavily into the mechanics and make them very solid. My name is Kristen Douglas Seitz. I'm a bronze artist and I work and live here on San Juan Island. I've been here for about seven years. And I'm also a workshop instructor and I also mentor artists one on one. This is Abby here. She was a lab. She's no longer with us, but she is immortalized in bronze and that is my specialty. I love connecting animals and people together. I feel like I've always had that purpose and drive to connect animals and people, and Abby was just one way of doing that. I also love doing public art installations with my clients across the country. And talking about Abby, so how I start with her and any bronze is we develop a clay model and we get an idea and an okay from the client. Once that is ready, we move on to the second stage, which is making a tabletop size maquette or this size of Abby that you see here. Once the clay is done, we ship it off to a professional mold maker, and then it goes on to the foundry where they do all of the casting and pouring there. The pieces come back to our studio here on island, and my mentor, Jocelyn Russell, who I also work with, her husband, Michael Dubail, is a professional uh, welder, and he does all of the welding in-house for us. I do all of the tooling and patinas and finishing work. We ship our work, and we show together across the country. I can't be more thankful to the museum and the Island Artist Registry for joining us as artists in our community. And I'm so thankful for everything that the museum has done to connect me with uh, my new clients as well. Hi, I'm David Harsh. I live on San Juan Island. This is my drawing of Aura. Uh, it probably started out as a 20 minute pose at a uh, local figure drawing session and was finished in the studio. I've been drawing from the figure since 1975. I was taught in an academic situation uh, to draw with conviction, to press real hard, uh, but to also use the eraser as a tool. Uh, these same materials, uh, very strong paper, uh, a uh, clay-based uh, colored pigment and the eraser have been used for about seven centuries. Uh, and uh, to talk about the uh, process of being a model, pass it on to Aura. My name's Aura and I've lived in the San Juan Islands for 23 years, my whole life. I'm an artist, musician, and a model. I've been figure modeling for the last several years and I find it to be a very personal and emotionally rewarding process. I also did a lot of figure drawing um, when I was in school for art, and I think that figure drawing is a really great way to consider and sort of meditate on all different kinds of people's bodies and the different ways that bodies move and, and feel and act. Personally, I'm a trans woman. I've been transitioning for about four years on uh, male to female hormones and figure modeling is a very personal 
and rewarding work for me to have others see, see how others see my body from a different perspective and to also just embody art and movement and separate a little bit from the personalness of it. Um, I think figure drawing is a really important and, and endless, endlessly explorable medium. I'd like to thank the museum very much for having us for this opportunity and thank David very much for his work. And I'd also like to thank the uh, museum uh, to the opportunity to show with so many uh, great artists on, on these islands. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Sherry Smith Bell, and I'm an artist and a poet and a writer. And I like to mix things up in my work where I try things out. So this piece that is in the show today is called Grief Point, which is a mixed media piece based on maps of our Salish Sea. And since moving to the San Juan Islands, I have been very much aware of our placement in the world and where the islands are in relationship to the land and to the water. So that's been a big inspiration all along. And this is part of a series. It's a map series. And what I do is I work with these maps that are of interest in terms of shape and form. And also, I use color, pencils, watercolor, crayons, and other materials to make a puzzle of the map, because maps, in a way, are a puzzle. And a lot of times you'll find in maps some really intriguing names and placement in, in on the map and in the map. And I use puzzles in terms of visual acuity, where I put things together. I tear things up, I replace them, I glue them down. And I use colored pencils and watercolor and crayons and all sorts of marking materials to emphasize different parts of my puzzle. So I hope you come to see it. I'd love to have you study maps and think about where we live and how our place in time in the water and in the world is affecting our views.